Hi, yeah. Thanks um, uh, to uh, welcome to Tone of Death printing your next persistence. So I, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the talk first and and how the talk's going to be structured. Um, firstly, we're going to we're going to discuss platform security. So go through the, the hardware security controls, how we analyze the um, the printers from from a hardware perspective. Then also moving into software security, um, looking for uh, like how all the software fits together and, and what the main components of the architecture are. Then I'm going to hand over to Cedric for remote exploitation. So um, network-based exploitation of the printer. Uh, and this was what we demonstrated at Pwn to Own. And then finally, um, we're going to discuss uh, maintaining persistence on the printer. So all the kind of uh, security, security uh, elements which are in the architecture and also a vulnerability which we found which could maintain persistence across boots and firmware updates. So um, who are we? We're NCC Group. It's a small team of three of us um, and we've been doing kind of vulnerability research and exploitation for quite a while, quite a long time uh, across lots of different areas and uh, like Windows, Linux, Mac, pretty much anything, anything which comes up. Um, and also in this research, we got um, we were supported by uh, the hardware security team because we're not experts in hardware security. So having that kind of skills to draw on was really valuable as well. Uh, I'm going to present about the hardware side, but I'm not a hardware expert, so I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, so the platform security overview. So what's actually happening in this talk? Um, it's all about our, our, our journey for Pwn to Own. So we we bought a Lexmark printer, but we didn't really have any idea about printer security. There wasn't really any research online about um, the current models of 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 Lexmark printers. Uh, there was previous like older models, but um, nothing for this one. So the 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 like our goals were really we needed to be able to analyze the software on the device. So we needed to be able to like get access to the binaries, be able to perform reverse engineering and do that stat uh, static reverse engineering. Where we also needed to be able to like, um, to debug the printer, do dynamic analysis, uh, do uh, run GDB, do all the kind of debugging on, on, the, on the device as well. And on embedded devices, it's sometimes not possible. Like that's one of the kind of main things to gain that platform visibility to start off with. Um, so we approached this by, it was like a two-pronged approach. We split into, we, we started off with hardware and then once we'd, we'd built that, um, these initial capabilities, we moved into analyzing the software. So in the hardware side, as I said, there wasn't very much information. We, we spent a lot of time doing like background research, Googling around, and there wasn't really anything. Um, we bought two printers um, so we could do destructive testing if we needed to um, do some kind of hardware attacks, which we, which we knew we wouldn't be able to recover the printer from. We had kind of one of one printer to sacrifice. Um, we looked at analyzing the firmware, like sniffing the updates of, of the network, but it turned out the, the OTA updates were, were encrypted. Um, we, we couldn't actually, we couldn't decrypt the images, so we, that was a bit of a dead end. So we basically had to uh, open the device up and attack it from a hardware perspective. Um, this is what the main PCB of the printer looks like. Uh, we, the first thing we did was we, we went through the different components on the PCB and, and tried to look for data sheets and information about the different, uh, the different components. The, the two main interesting ones we found were, which we were interested in analyzing were the um, the Marvel SOC and a Micron NAND flash. The, the, the Marvel SOC is a SOC specific for the printer industry. Um, there, was, there was no public data sheets for this. Uh, there was a press release saying that they'd made it for the, for the printer industry, but that was literally it. Uh, it's an ARM-based SOC, um, and that, that was kind of what, what we needed to know initially, really. Uh, so. We also wanted to uh, analyze the NAND because we were trying to get an access to to the to the firmware. Um, we we were speculating that the 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 software probably wasn't um, encrypted on the flash. So if we dumped the flash, then we'd be able to get access to the actual binaries. 
Um, so this was, yeah, it was a micron flash. Um, and the key thing is that it's the 2G and the model number for this is actually, it's two gigabits. So it's 256 meg of, of NAND flash. Um, then we also looked for like the common connectors. So looking for things like JTAG and UART. Um, this is this is UART here. We found a JRIP2 on, on the board, which uh, was the serial UART. We started off by um, the common approach of going through, working out what uh, each, analyzing each of the pins to work out which is TX, which is RX, which is VCC and ground, um, and uh, and then soldering onto the onto the UART to to obtain a um, to obtain output from the from the UART. We were kind of hoping that there would be a there would be a shell on the device just through um, just through UART, but it turns out the the TX pin was enabled was enabled, so we could get the output from from the bootloader from U-Boot, and we could see the um, the kernel. It was based on Linux, like Yocto Linux, and the um, and the load addresses for the kernel, but we couldn't actually get um, an interactive shell. We we thought so. The RX pin looked like it was disabled. We didn't actually investigate too much into that. It could have been the possibility that it was just like a depopulated component on the PCB, or they'd broken the traces, and we would just have to reconstruct them. Um, but for what we needed to do, then um, we found a way we could we could work around this. So it wasn't a, like a showstopper. Um, so the next thing we needed to do was extract the the firmware from the flash. So to do that, um, we used a, a TSOP48 um, adapter connected to a flash programmer. So actually, to to remove the flash from the from the PCB, it's a pretty delicate job. It it requires you to get a heat gun and um, melt the actual solder on each of the pins and then lift the and remove the the chip from the PCB without actually damaging any of the pins. We also needed to clean the pins as well to make sure that the uh, like the data which we were reading off the, with the flash programmer was uh, was correct and that we weren't getting bad reads when reading the the data from the chip. Um, it was also important to align the pins correctly into the adapter. We also did things like we we unsoldered and uh, and then resoldered as well. Um, and it took about uh, it took like half an hour to remove the chip and then about an hour to resolder it back on. And that all had to be done under a microscope as well. So it wasn't like super straightforward. Um, but then we got the we read the content from the chip, and um, uh, we well we were able to select a like a model which was close to the model which we were analyzing in the programmer, and we obtained a dump of the data. Um, so when we got our data, the next thing to do was to was to analyze the data and, and understand the contents of the firmware dump. So the firmware dump itself is um, 272 meg megabytes in, in size. That was more than the expected um, NAT size of the NAND flash. So we worked out that the, the extra bytes were likely out of band data. They weren't actually relevant to the data which we were, we were trying to analyze and get access to the binaries. Um, and we needed to remove the out of band data from from the image before we could uh, before we could analyze it. So the out of band data is things for like error correction, bad block management, and so on. Uh, we worked out that it had a 248 bytes page size with 128 bytes of out of band data. Um, so this, once you remove the out of band data, gives you 125 megabytes of of, of usable data, and that's just what this diagram is is showing. So the the next thing we've got we've got our dump, um, but we 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 want to extract the file systems. We want to get the binaries out from from the actual from the raw data. Um, we we identify by looking through the dump. We found uh, the UBI uh, block signature. So there's a series of magic bytes for the UBI file system, which uh, essentially uh, shows where the UBI blocks start, and then you can you just use the open source tooling. A UBI reader tooling to to actually extract the volumes and um, and dump the data from from the file system. The two interesting ones to us are the base UBI file system. So that contains all the kind of printer related binaries, the operating system binaries which are inside of Yocto, and the uh, internal storage which is the the user user flash. So um, so things like the config files and so on. Um, 
once we've done this, once we've got the UBI file system out of it, we can now, it's a, it contains this, uh, the squash FS file, uh, file format. And um, then we can use unsquash FS to basically, to, to unsquash the, the volumes and extract the actual like file system and, and get the binaries. Okay, so this is that was like kind of the end for from the hardware perspective. We can we can now um, we can dump the flash and we can start reverse engineering and looking for vulnerabilities. But I just want to give a quick overview of the how the printer architecture actually works because um, this is the first time I looked at a printer and it was it's it's a fairly novel architecture. Uh, it's based on Yocto Linux, which is uh, it's it's kind of it's fairly common. It's used for uh, it's like build your own embedded Linux distribution and and make customizations to it. So what Lexmark have done, they've taken the the base Yocto image and they'd written their own uh, layers or recipes essentially, which go over the top of the uh, Yocto image. Um, so they've got their own things like for providing support for Rust, uh, like uh, providing support for like Python net networking and, and their own layers. Um, so what I like after that kind of brief operating system analysis, we started mapping out the at external attack surfaces because for Pwn to own, we need to, it has to be a remote attack over the network. Um, so the most obvious thing is like network listening services, network listening ports. We didn't have a shell, so we couldn't um, run we couldn't run netstat on there at the point at that point so we just kind of had to do that through like opening binaries in ida and and looking at config files and working out what the um uh, what what binaries map back to what ports in the mmap scans and, and so on and mapping things out and really understanding the attack surface um then one of the the next key component within lexmark's uh, architecture is this thing called the remote object service bus um the remote object service bus is, it's a, a service which listens on, on TCP and then all kind of uh, functionality on the Lexmark printer can interact with the, with the bus and they can um, like put messages on the bus uh, and listen for events and so on. Uh, and it allows it all to communicate together. So it's like an R RPC based mechanism over, over TCP and UDP sockets. Um, it's quite novel in that it's written in Rust. Uh, they've obviously tried to uh, write this key component of their architecture in a memory safe language um, because it's 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 fairly critical to the printer's functionality. If it crashes, then the printer just doesn't work. So, um, yeah, and it allows you to share information and communicate. And it's like the main focal point on the device. So the the next thing is uh, the Rob Rob tools like. Yeah, this is basically just for communication on the bus. It's what a developer would use for for communicating. You can actually use um, the 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 applications can use code, and they can they they can write C code to actually uh, send messages using the Rob bus. So this is displaying a message uh, using the uh, like yeah, displaying a message prompt, and then a, an application will will use this to display a message. So. The, what about all the rest of the components on there? Like, is everything written in Rust? No, that's not the case. The um, the it, maybe it's because uh, it's like uh, like a new component, but everything else is um, is quite is written in C and is not memory safe. So, what about core dumps? Like, how do we analyze crashes and uh, do that? Like, do debugging and so on. We we can get. Um, we can download car dumps, but they're encrypted, so we can't analyze them. But we do have a crash stack output from from UART, so we can analyze that. But we don't have registers, or, um, and it's hard to write an exploit without having registers. Like you can do it, but it's not it's not perfect. Um, the next thing is Hydra, which is a network based service. Um, it listens on TCP port nine one zero zero, and it handles. Um, two main languages in the printer, printer job language and printer control, control language. There's a large amount of um, code within this binary. Uh, we also looked at the mitigations on this. Like We were like, how do we attack this? Like Network-based attacks are, are kind of ob obvious, um, but uh, we started off, but because we had no debug capability, we started off looking for logic bugs. 
Um, so starting off like looking at the external data flowing in and and following that through the uh, through the code and looking for vulnerabilities. This is what um, PGL looks like if you've not seen it before. Uh, essentially, there's a command handler, handler, and for each of the different PGL commands, then you can um, register a handler for that code. And we went through them one by one and focused on the Lexmark proprietary PGL extensions. The one we're interested in is LDL welcome screen, which is Lexmark proprietary. I'm now going to hand over to Cedric to talk about the actual vulnerabilities which we found. So. Okay, so let's analyze uh, one remedy we've, we've exploited uh, during Pwn to Own. So Alex mentioned this PGL uh, protocol, and let's look at one of the remedy we found, which is a firewide vulnerability, how we got remote code execution. So yeah, there is an undocumented command called LD welcome screen, which is not in the PGL uh, specification. It's only uh, in the Lexmark, uh, how they use it. So you have this um, code that basically uh, shows that the command accept a file as an argument, and it's actually then calling um, a sub function, internal function. The internal function, actually what it does, it does uh, three things. It opens a file descriptor uh, for the specific file name you, you specify in the command argument. Then it calls a sub function. Um, and at the end, it actually uh, closed the file descriptor and call calls this remove function, which, as you can imagine, deletes the file. So at first we're like, okay, this is a file write, but it deletes the file. It's not going to be useful, right? Um, first, first thing we can see in this function. The other thing is the open function. It looks like it's actually only allowing us to write files that are not existing, otherwise it's going to fail. And it's only allowing us to write content, not to read it. So let's look at the actual internal function. Internally, um, I, I'm, I'm just going to skip the whole function, but it's just a big function. We actually wrote a blog with a uh, lot of information about the function. But all you need to understand about this function is that it's going to basically write data by chunks. And it's going to basically read up to 400 bytes of data. Um, and if you send this 400 bytes, it's going to flush it to disk. And then it's going to do it again and again and reuse the same buffer. It's going to do that until you send this magic footer, PGL and data. And at that point, it says, OK, I've received everything. Uh, I can skip that, that footer. Uh, the file has been written. And obviously, if you send that footer, it's going to end the function. And it's going to return to the caller. And it's going to remove, as we've seen, the actual uh, file. So the file gets deleted. However, what you can do is you can uh, send some data, 400 bytes at a time. And at some point, you just uh, stop sending anything and just wait. And because you haven't sent the footer, the file uh, possibly remains uh, and you, the function doesn't return yet. It hangs. And so the file potentially exists. At that time, we do everything blind. So we're not sure if the file exists, if actually it works. But that's our assumption. The other thing to take into account is that um, because it flushes the data on disk only after 400 bytes, if you need to to write data that is not a multiple of 400, you need to pad it. So it's actually writing everything by padding with spaces or zeros, depending on the type of the file. But that's, that's still promising. We potentially maybe can make it hang. So because we were doing everything blind, we needed some way of confirming that the file was written. So we found this CGI script that you can uh, browse through the web interface. And we can see from the code that uh, it's actually showing the content of the file. And fortunately, we can write that specific file and debug.log.1, for instance. And then we can confirm from the, the, from the web interface that all the A's uh, are shown on the web interface, which confirmed that we wrote a file and it's existing on disk. The other thing that it allowed us to do is that we're able to confirm that the file stays on disk for like more than one minute. So that gives us a window where we can do something useful potentially. Remember, we do everything blind at the moment. We don't have a shell, so it's kind of a little bit annoying. Um, we also noticed that if the file exists, it's going to print a document. And if the file doesn't exist, it doesn't print a document. This kind of thing that gives us information. Um, we, we, lo we, lo uh, we kill lots of paper during this, during this work. Um, OK, we spend a lot of, of time to actually um, find a way to get code execution. 
because we only had a file ride. We didn't have visibility at that time. We didn't have platform visibility. Um, we, we, we could find out that most of the file system was mounted as, as read-only, and we couldn't overwrite existing files, like I said. However, we, we did end up finding this uh, mechanism that we could abuse, which is uh, the abort mechanism. It's a Linux feature which allows you to um, um, define config files that will be used when a crash occurs in any of the user land process. And it turns out the way it works is that the config files contains um, um, bash commands. So basically, and they run as root because obviously it's to, to handle a crash uh, for any process on the system, which is very handy, right? Um, that's exactly what we need. So the question is, how can we trigger a crash remotely so we can uh, abuse it to get code execution? On the right, you just see a crash. Uh, what happens is basically the crash handler will um, show a blue screen of death, really, and then it will basically make you reboot the, 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 the printer. You can't do anything. And it's going to like uh, uh, prepare the crash dump and everything. So we actually um, at, at the beginning we when we found the when we found the file right we were not sure we could abuse it so we did some fuzzing and stuff so we actually had some bugs some crashes that we hadn't triaged because basically we we didn't have any platform visibility so it's hard to exploit a, a crash where you don't have any backtrace and, uh, or a, 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 a minimal backtrace but no registers. But we had first HTTP, one of them, and so through HTTP fuzzing, we could find um, that on the UART, we could see that the the, the oak uh, process was crashing. So it wasn't really clear why when you fuzz HTTP, the oak process cra uh, crashes. But basically, after we got um, um, a shell on the box, we actually triaged that bug to understand what why it was actually crashing. And it turns out if you pass a specific for, uh, string to oak uh, with a file that hasn't, doesn't exist, it's going to crash. There's like an invalid pointer happening. So very not exploitable crash, obviously, but for our case, it's, it's useful. And so we triaged it after we got the shell. And it turns out there is a race condition in the way the logs files are handled for the HTTP server. Because they're basically what they do is there is a log rotation every 32k um, bytes of logs, and there is a script that's going to handle that log file, and it's it's um, working on a, a file name that has a, a one second granularity. So if you send a lot of uh, requests and the server creates a lot of log, it may happen that you have two instances of the script happening in, at the same one second level, and one of them is going to delete the file, and the other one is going to try to access it, resulting in, into a, a, a race condition and, and, a, and a crash for the oak into the second one. So this is basically the, the full chain for our exploit now. We have three threads. The first thread is responsible to exploit the PageL file write vulnerability to write this fake config file on the file system when we have write permissions. Um, during that what, one minute window, we have to trigger a crash um, over HTTP to crash the GOG process. And it's going to use the abort config file. And it's going to basically uh, execute our command. And we can start a netcat and, and then connect to it. So this is a demo. I have a demo for that first RC vulnerability. So the first thing we do is we create that file. So we wait a little bit just to make sure um, the file is created. And but not too long, so we can trigger the crash and the file still exists. Now we've, we've detected we've, uh, the firewall was disabled, and yeah, cool, we have a shell. OK, so that's all. We've done for Pwn to own really because we had a shell that was cool. One idea we had was to investigate how we can persist on the printer because there hasn't been much done on this in this area. Um, and the other thing is, um, from a real uh, world perspective, there is no antivirus on on a printer. There is no EGR. There is no uh, visibility. If you get Pwn, you don't know. Uh, there is no automatic update. So even for known vulnerability, you can't. You usually don't patch it. 
And sure, you can print lots of stuff on a printer, so it has potentially useful information. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to figure out if we could persist um, on a printer, not only uh, if it gets rebooted, but also across firmware updates. If it gets updated, can we persist? So we're going to look at different uh, angles. We're going to look at how we can maybe persist using uh, like the boot chain, maybe seeing if there is secure boot, if we can bypass it, if there is. Uh, and then also from the file system point of view, uh, can we write any file on a live system that if you reboot it will allow you to persist? And we're going to finally show you one remedy that we exploited to persist, which is uh, in the uh, SNMP uh, config file, how we inject it to get persistence. So it's going to be on the file system, the one we use at the end. So um, Alex mentioned already the UB uh, data that you can see on the bottom right, um, which is the, basically the file system that we were interested in just when we were doing bug hunting for Pontoon. One. But now that we want to, to persist, looking at the actual, uh, the, the actual part of the file, file system partition is quite useful. So the first thing uh, on, the bot on the top left, we can see it's trusted one. So potentially it it's actu actually has secure boot. It has a very old issue date, which means it doesn't update it very often. Then there is a boot flash sign of FE which yeah it's probably worth mentioning here that uh, all the flag all the names and flags we and and of of the the specific uh, headers here have been uh, not only reverse engineered from the flash but also there has been some leaked information from uh, marvel which helped us naming stuff which makes it pretty sure it's actually valid so for the boot flash sign FE was not actually documented by Marvel, but usually this flag is used to um, define where the rest of the data will be. So usually if it's in another NAND, another NOR, in this case it's FE. But because in our case, everything was on the same flash, we assume maybe FE means it's on the same flash. Then we have um, a header indicating the number of images, which is in our case is four. So we, we see TIMH, OBMI, Oslo and TRDX in the middle. Um, and so um, if we look at the actual um, uh, header information, we see that we have the load address where it's going to be loaded into memory. And then there's a hash. This hash, we figured out that is actually a SHA-256 of the actual data. The data, you can see it on the right. Um, you have the actual data for the uh, trusted header. Uh, then you have the OBMI, which is the first bootloader in the chain, written by Marvel Custom. And then you have a second boot letter, which is Oslo, which is actually U-boot. And then you have the Linux kernel uh, into a, a TRDX um, part. And finally, you have the UB data, which is the file system that uh, Alex mentioned earlier. It's, it was interesting to see that, yeah, we could confirm the SHA-256 were valid for all the parts and the TIMH didn't have um, a valid hash, it was zero. The last thing I haven't explained is on the bottom left, which is the key information. It has a key ID of JTAG. So we haven't investigated JTAG, but it mentions like public keys and stuff. And also there is a digital signature with like RSA private key, at least from the Marvel documentation. So I'm not sure what, why you would, you, you would store a private key into something, but yeah. So um, the, the few ideas we had to actually exploit the the boot chain was sure we we couldn't get a shell by hitting enter really fast at boot on the UART. We're not sure, as Alex mentioned, that it was because of the hardware um, not enabling it, or if it was because UBoot was actually disabling it for the, from the software. And there is a way in UBoot to actually um, enable the way that you can hit a key. It's called the boot delay uh, variable. And by default, by re reversing, we, we actually found out that it's minus two, so it makes sense you can't hit a key. So one idea would be to patch that minus two to be five, ref um, patch it on, on disk and see if it boots. And if it does, then maybe in try to interact with it. It's a lot of if, because obviously it has to be no secure boot and whatever, but that's something we had uh, in mind. The other idea we had was um, mod modifying the actual UBFS partition and the partition that has the, some scripts that are started at boot to actually modify them to just run a telnet command and, and get persistent with that. Um, but for the second one, it, it would be only possible if the file system 
which is in a specific partition is not actually uh, security checked. So yeah, um, that's basically kind of all we've done on the secure boot, mainly because we actually found a way to persist without it. But I think it brings the, the ground uh, for more research. So we, we noticed that there is no bootloader uh, encryption, there is no kernel encryption, there is no file system encryption. Um, and so, yeah, the question would be, is, is the security checked among the different steps uh, in the boot chain? Okay, so let's move to the file system security now and how we manage to persist and actually what, what is possible to do. So looking at the actual file system, we can see quickly that the, most of the file system is read-only. Uh, like Alex was mentioning, it's based on the fact that they use the SquashFS. Um, and then there are uh, different partitions. We don't list them all here, but here it's a few ideas of the things that they have. But it's pretty locked down, in our opinion. So there is this NV mirror uh, partition, which is um, um, you can write on it, but it's actually not persistent from what we've been testing. We think because it's a mirror, it's just to, for um, redundancy, but it's actually not, actually not uh, persistent. And then there is the, this overlay mechanism that is used um, a lot, which is basically relying on the fact that um, you have um, uh, a lower directory, which is mounted as read-only, and then they add upper layers for specific folders to allow you to write on it. So effectively, yeah, allowing you to write on a read-only actually partition, mounted partition. But then because the point is not to persist, uh, if you reboot, it's going to be volatile. You just lose all the changes, which is very handy from a security, security perspective. Um, we did try to write the etc lib report events.d, uh, which is the path we have used for the previous file write vulnerability to write the config file. But as you can imagine, it's not persistent because of this overlay mechanism. Uh, we investigated other things like run. Uh, run is interesting because you have this file which is run debug level debug, which is a specific file for like Spark printers, at least for this one, where if you if this file exists at boot, it's going to be basically into a, a de developer mode uh, printer, which has features like it disables the firewall and stuff like that. So it was potentially interesting, but yeah, it doesn't persist either. One thing that is interesting is the settings, which are stored into varfs. So the varfs partition is actually where the user data is mounted. Um, and the settings are interesting because um, that's something we can write and, and that helps us to configure the printer. So if you look a little bit more at the settings, uh, now that we have platform visibility, we have a shell, we can see how they are implementing this. We can see they store settings into a uh, block data file, like dot data file, in two folders, shared and shared netapps. They use two, two different tools, which are on the printer as well, read block value and netapps read block value. And so for instance, here is an invocation. You have, um, you can specify a debug flag. Here we, we, we see lo lots of debugs, then the path where the settings are, and then the, the, the name or the ID of the setting. So here we see the, the sale number is YYY at the very bottom. And in between, we see that it, it's actually into a specific block 44, 54.data. And we see this information like the size of the data and, and so on. So we rewrote our own uh, Python script to uh, pass uh, this, the, all the settings. It was interesting to see that um, our tooling was passing more settings than the actual tool on, on, on the, the printer. So there are actually a lot of settings. Um, yeah, and it was just easier to do than doing it on the printer. Okay, now let's look at the one of, one of the beauty we found in the SNMP handling. So our idea, uh, the scenario we want to evaluate is we assume we have an, an RC already on the printer, for instance, our previously demonstrated PGL file write on a specific version, and we want to install a backdoor. And then we want to make sure after a reboot, we still have the backdoor in place. And after a firmware update, do we still have the backdoor in place? So the vulnerability we found is uh, we can trigger it through um, the SNMP settings. So using the web interface, we go to a specific menu. We assume we have a admin account, we can log in. And so um, we go into a SNMP menu and we 
we, we, there is a field uh, where we can set read-only credentials. So in this field, we, we set EDG, because that's the name of our team, read-write producer in the username. So after we do that, we investigate the settings, how it's been stored. So it's a very, very simple format. It's basically an ID, which is incremental. We see in red, C, D, E for each field. And then there is the size of the, of the field in te 10 hex, and then the actual field, EDG, read, write, create user, and so on. So it's very simple, easy to modify, right? So the other thing we want to see is where, where this field is propagated. So actually, if you look at the actual SNMP config file, you can see that the EDG read write producer field is in a specific RO user uh, name, uh, line, sorry. And so here, yeah, here you can probably guess what's coming. What happens if we inject a new line in a RO user field to add an extra line? And next question, can we extend the SNMP MIB to add specific features? So it turns out the first time we, we, we tried that, um, we kind of failed. Um, so we basically decided to patch the block uh, data file using our scripts that we wrote uh, to basically change the, because the, the file format is really simple, uh, we can just patch the, the size and just uh, patch the data. So I'm not sure if you guys can see the, the problem here, but um, at first we didn't really know. But basically we tried to extend the the, the, the MIB by adding a new line and then adding the extend sh command to extend the MIB with specific arguments to, to touch a file in TMP. Um, it turns out after doing that, we reboot the printer and bad luck, printer is, is a brick, broken. Okay, well, we, we are three on, on team, so we have two other printers, so we can still do stuff. Two more changes. Um, it turns out at that time we didn't really know we, we were we were trying to do it fast so we didn't investigate it but when preparing this conversation I was looking at this actual uh, output I was like hmm there's this backslash a backslash D should just be backslash n uh, slash n not two so basically there is a weird character injected into the config file and, and probably here it's probably bad like at boots SNMP the process just dies so, but yeah, it's, we don't know for sure because we haven't tried to, for sure to patch it and check that there is no other side effect. So anyway, we had two printers left. We're like, okay, let's do it more, more like safely. So we basically looked uh, again at the SNMP menu. We're like, okay, let's, let's basically input as much of the string we want close to the final thing we want just to avoid any problem. Um, and so we have this B extend SH which basically tells that it adds for a specific OID in, in SNMP um, to a source with a dot, a specific varfs a script, and then we add the comments to, to comment the rest of the, 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 the thing. And the idea is you want to be adding a, a, a new line between B and XNSH, so it actually adds a new line and then XNSH adding our, extending our MIB. It's a minimum amount of changes, and so, so we've, we've done that. We confirmed that by uh, restarting SNMP util before rebooting, it injects it correctly. There is no weird thing. SNMP still doesn't die. And yeah, and now we can basically um, reboot the printer. And after rebooting, because we've extended the MIB, we can use SNMP work from our computer to request the OID 1.2. And it's going to trigger this uh, additional command. And the, the initially, before rebooting, obviously, we need to create this varfs a script file that will start a netcat uh, when we execute that SNMP command. Okay, so we have another demo for that. Okay, so the first thing is we use the, the SSH to install the backdoor. So it's it's like a vulnerable version to uh, to our file right so we uh, we have a shell uh, already just to show you uh, the shell so we're going to basically execute our um um our script to persist so it's it's tell it's telling us to log in on the web interface and to add that specific b extend sh base command without the backslash n over the web interface we just need to also set the password just to so it's accepted 
So now it's done. So now we're gonna let the script run and it's gonna automatically download over SSH uh, the, the block file, patch it, and then send it back. Now it's saying, okay, reboot the file system, pray, and see if the backdoor stays. So here the, the, the printer is not loaded yet. We see the web interface is happening now, is live. So we're gonna execute our SNMP walk command, ask for the 1.2, and it's gonna execute our uh, netcat and we can access our netcat. So it's not finished because can we actually persist for a, an update, right? So here it's, we're, patch, we're actually updating the printer to a, ver a version that is patched to our PGL file right. And again, pray. So here it's been updated to a new version. And again, same thing. So I think at that stage we're quite happy that we were able to persist. Um, so we did decide it, we did decide to report it to to Lexmark. We we're like, do we keep it for next point to one so we have an advantage, you know, with like debug capability on the printer? And we're like, okay, we'll report it. So we reported in in, in uh, June. It was patched in July. Very good response. One thing worth worth uh, saying is that uh, the persistence because we are modifying the data. We, we persist among reboot and update, but we don't persist if the user does like a reset of the configuration. Um, and yeah, so I think the, we're quite impressed by the, the base architecture based on like uh, a really modern operating system, uh, which is uh, not like, like um, really shitty IoT based on like super, um, bad um, Linux version and stuff. Here it was quite modern. Uh, the responsive vendor was very good, gave us really good impression. They handled both bugs really well with us. The architecture ar ar uh, using Rust on a printer was quite good in our opinion. Um, one thing is that once we actually got platform visibility on the printer, we, f we felt like actually issues could be found. And it was to us, it was like a little bit like security through, through obscurity where once you have platform visibility, it's, you can find problems. The other thing is lots of services that are facing over the internet actually are written in C or in, in scripts. So you have uh, uh, an attack surface that is um, not uh, zero. They, they don't have any update, uh, auto-update mechanism at the moment. So it's really, I think in our opinion, that would actually make it a lot better. And the mitigations among um, binaries is really not, uh, like some binaries ha have really good mitigation, others don't. So it's really not the same. And from the at from the hardware perspective, they don't have any uh, encryption, so we can access the the, fi the, the files uh, by dumping the flash. Before I get questions, um, we actually spend three months. Uh, sorry, we actually spend three people one month, uh, all three people on one month on the actual bug, exploiting it. It feels a lot for us. It was actually a good journey because we had not, um, we didn't have any hardware experience, so we learned a lot in the process. Um, I know some people spend a lot less on exporting bugs on the Xbox. So just to show you that, if you are lucky versus not lucky as well, depending on what you attack first, it may vary. So this time, don't take it as an example. You you may find bugs a lot quicker, and. Um, and we spend two weeks on the actual persistence to exploit it and, and have it persistent. That's all for us. Thank you very much. If you have questions.